Hello everybody, Michael here for Tactical Imperialis and welcome to today's video. Today is episode 3 for my Warhammer Age of Sigmar hobby project, A Town Called Malice, a pun so bad that I can't believe nobody called me out on it last time. Uh, whatever. So today I'm going to be showing off two new units for you today, um, one proper actual unit and one character model. Um, if you saw last week's battle report then you do um, know what these guys are, or you will have seen these guys before. So if you want to watch the battle report just to see how the army's performing, check the link in the description uh, for the English and the French version. Um, but you don't have to do that for the context of this video, I will probably make as few references as I can to it without at least providing proper context in the video. So yes, six models to show off today. Um, and these include the very first models that I actually painted. Um, so you'll get something, excuse my shoe on the chair. Yes, you'll get uh, you'll get something very interesting, some discussions of like how the paint scheme came to be because that's what these guys come from. I do um, realize very quickly with Stormcast uh, that unlike my previous Age of Sigmar hobby project, An Elfin Adventure, which um, I did like two years ago, so most of you probably haven't seen it. Um, Stormcast get very repetitive. Um, I don't mean that it's a chore to paint them, it's just they're less varied because in my previous series I was working on Witch Elves and then doing Executioners and then I was doing Blood Rat Medusae and then I was doing Cold One Nights and I was doing all sorts of different units for my Dark Elves. And the unit variety and that really helped diversify what you were doing in a painting sense and it made talking about the paint scheme in videos much easier. Whereas these guys, you kind of know everything I'm doing at this point and there's very little to explain but I will endeavour to do so as well as providing some tactical insight about the models. So I think that's everything I need to say going in um, and remember tomorrow the French version of this video will be coming out if you wish to see it. So with all that said let's dive in and we'll start with the units because I think there's a little bit more tactically to discuss there. This is episode three for a town called Malice. Let's go. So, behold the unit that we're adding to the army today. Five Decimators, a set of paladins armed with thunder axes, including one with a star soul mace. These guys are very, very cool. Um, both in terms of aesthetic, uh, rules, and lore. Um, it's a really short paragraph within the uh, Stormcast Battle Center, which I've got in front of me here. I'm just going to try very, very quickly and find it because it makes me laugh every time I read it. And it's part of the reason I chose to do Decimate first. I'll explain the full logic in a minute, but um, part of the reason was this. Um, As it dawns upon the enemy forces, hitherto confident in their superiority, they are but simple fodder before these giants in their midst. Uh, then what they thought would be an overwhelming raid turns into an undignified rout. The decimators care not which way this hostile sea flows, and their reaping strikes do not stop until every single one of the God King's enemies is added to the mound of dismembered body parts slowly accumulating around their positions. Basically, they just stand there and kill everything within range and don't care about anything else. It's kind of funny. Uh, well, I find it kind of funny. It's like, yeah, we're not here for honor, for glory, for Sigma. It's just, you are in my way you are going down. <laughs> and I find that really quite amusing. Um, and they're also very well trained because they know exactly where to stand so they don't get whacked by each other's axes because, you know, as you do. So, how do they work in game? Let's let's go with that because the paint scheme you've seen before, there's nothing much new to talk about here. In fact, there's nothing new to talk about. This was the original scheme. So, on the tabletop, these guys have a two inch reach on their weapons uh, that hit on threes, wound on threes, with one rend and one damage. Nothing special, but then you see their attack stat, which is equivalent to the number of models from the target unit within range. So, let's say, for instance, you throw yourselves into 10 infantry, and you have 5 models within 2 inches of each of your decimators. Each decimator will make 5 attacks. That is ludicrous amounts of damage. These guys, when deployed and attacked correctly, can dish out so much pain because they just have so many attacks each. You, you deploy them correctly and you set up a good charge, they can kill things way beyond their number count and probably way beyond their point count in one go. They just hit so damn hard. This does come with a drawback, however. They are absolutely 100% useless at fighting single models, characters, and elite infantry. 
Because if you throw them at elite infantry, the most attacks you're probably going to get per guy is three. Three attacks, three ren, one damage. Three, uh, three attacks, three threes, one ren, one damage. It's not bad, actually. So you might do, but you wouldn't get enough attacks across the board to make it stick. So really where you want these guys is fighting hordes of infantry. And at that, they excel. The Star Soul Mace is a weapon that is allowed across all Paladin units. It's an upgrade weapon, which is basically um, an arcane bolt on a stick. Uh, because it's a 1-inch range attack, you use it in the combat phase, pick an enemy unit, do D3 mortal wounds to it. It's an arcane bolt on a stick. And it's it's nothing special. It's pretty helpful. Um, and I think it's probably of more use to um, decimators because it allows them to at least finish off small units. So let's say you've charged a 20-man unit, you've killed like 16 of them, so you're not getting many attacks anymore. Oh, it's alright, you've got a Star Soul Mage, you can just ping off D3 wounds at a time, and they'll start falling over. And it means that if they get charged by, say, a hero, they're not completely impotent with one attack each. You've at least got a constant source of damage output. There's no hit roll required, no wound roll required, it's just you do D3 mortal wounds straight up which is really kind of nice. Um, their one downside, well, they have a couple of downsides. The main one being that they're movement four. They are incredibly slow, so you do require, I believe, Scions of the Storm to make them work. Um, because these guys need to hit melee as quickly as possible, because they cost, what is it, 200? Oops. Something like 200 points? I think it's 200. Um, yeah, 200 points. They're not cheap. They're really not cheap, um, so you need to make your points back, and these guys, that means going through a whole heap of infantry. Like, that's killing 10 liberators, that's killing, yeah, 10 liberators, for example, maybe killing 20, yeah, maybe 20, um, decent infantry, 30 bad infantry. You've got to go through a whole heap of guys, and you can't just make it back in a single combat round, because it's... It's just not going to fly. So these guys do need to get into combat quickly, and they're slow. So having Signs of the Storm will really help these guys, and that's how I used them in the battle report last week. The other risk that they have, and this is something I really noticed in the battle report, is they are very susceptible to modifiers. That minus one modifier that the Saurus Warriors had in the first couple of turns really slowed the Decimators down. The Decimators still did buckets of damage and actually almost won the melee, but it really did slow them down. So... You may want to consider having a nullifier around, um, like a priest. Um, is there an unbinding hero? I'm ninety percent Stormcast have a hero that can unbind. Um, I'm trying to remember which one now. Um, I'm sure, one of them can. Um, yes, the Lord Veritant. So you may want to consider the Lord Veritant um, to unbind for you, which is kind of nice. And it would also allow them to kill the wizards uh, in a quite effective way. So a Lord Veritas might combo with these guys quite nicely. They are pretty tough, particularly if you have the ways to give out Mystic Shield, which you don't in Stormcast. Um, three wounds at a four-up save is, is pretty decent, but you don't have the shield. So in a way, these guys are... They are more durable than Liberators, but not by much. They have an extra wound as opposed to a reroll of ones to save. So they do die, but... They're not too bad, but they are susceptible to rend because they don't have that 3 plus save of the Stormcast Heroes. Then again, 4 plus save, Age of Sigma, it's pretty damn good. Now, you're probably wondering to yourself, why didn't I pick Retributors or Protectors, the other two Paladin options? Because Retributors are very solid all-rounders, they're packing damage too quite a lot. Protectors are really good at anti-monster, which is something that I've acknowledged myself. Oops, sorry, not the camera. Something I've acknowledged myself my army doesn't have right now is a good way to deal with big stuff. So either the Stormstrike Glaze that D6 damage on a 6 to wound against monsters and have a lot of attacks and also gives them shooting protection. The Retributors who just pick up damage too and it can do mortal wounds. Both of those units had potential in this army. Um, Retributors are slightly more expensive and Protectors are the same cost, just for those who are wondering. The reason I went with Decimators was partly for that lore thing, because I found that lore thing kind of hilarious. And also because I was more worried about being overwhelmed by numbers than I was by a single model. Because I accept that if my army gets stuck in a protracted melee with a single monster, I'm gonna lose. But 
Thanks to the Lord Aqualore, I can teleport units around. So I can teleport him around, I can teleport the Vanguard Hunters around. When I have the Vanguard Raptors and Vanguard Paladors, I'll be able to teleport them around. I can really actually get around quite easily. And if you get something like the Knight Vexilor, who I believe has a, uh, a one-use-only teleport as well, I can deal with one single monster, particularly if I can start peppering it with shooting and get its wounds down so it's quite slow. So I'm not as concerned by single monsters unless they can regenerate or if they can close distance with my Lord Aqualor and kill him, because then that takes a lot of my maneuverability away. I discussed that last time. I was more concerned of if I get charged or run at by a horde of 50 infantry, there is absolutely nothing I can do about it. I'm not going to have enough shooting in my Bolt Storm pistols. I'm not going to have enough maneuverability to escape them. I need to be able to deal with that infantry. And the logical answer to that, therefore, was Decimators. Because Retributors can do a theoretical 4 damage per model. Two attacks do damage each. These guys can do as many attacks as they have models near them. They can absolutely chew through infantry. I mean, with minus one to hit, they put paid to a good 15 or 20 Saurus before they went down in the battle report. They went through loads of them. If that had been Blood Reavers, or if that had been um, basic infantry, uh, Empire Spearmen, I don't know. Think of your army's basic infantry. Without a minus one to hit, those guys would have absolutely made mincemeat out of them. So I'm not concerned about dealing with hordes of infantry as much, because I can still pepper them with shooting, and when it comes to the melee, my decimators can just rip them a new one. That's what they're there to do. They're very, very good at it. There is a logistical reason as well why I didn't take protectors, and that's because I'm worried that the glaives will break in transit when I bring them home from France. There, there was a slight concern of I don't want to do protectors. I did weigh up retributors, but I decided on decimators because also I like round numbers and I'm, um, my army is actually quite nicely in round numbers right now. Um, it rounds up to exactly a thousand and actually my newest acquisition will change that. But you'll see that in a few weeks. So that's pretty much all there is to say on the decimators. I'm just going to move the lighting ever so slightly so you can get a proper, there we go, let's go with that, a proper look at the paint scheme. Because this is the most gold that I think you've properly um, seen on the models. And it's probably your first proper look at the armor in some cases. Because if I take my Prime, for example, which is this guy right here, he's got all the extra gold trim on the thigh, on the uh, uh, shin pads. He's got obviously that massive piece of gold armor there, which is dry brush with Sigmarites rather than Auric armor. Um, but there was a lot more Sigmarite on these guys than on anybody else because of the fact that I was still experimenting. Uh, again, you've got a lot more gold here. That's his double-sided Thunder Axe. And the Paladins also have these backpacks. I'm not quite sure what the backpacks are. It may be in the Battle Tome, and I've just missed it. But I'm not quite sure what the backpacks are. I'm assuming that there's some sort of, like, power thingy. But then why don't Liberators have them? I don't know. Whatever. Um, so that's what these guys look like. Um, red uh, is still the unifying colour, spot colour. There's less red on these guys because there's no top knot or anything. But they've still got the belt and the trim on the tabard. Uh, and it's still for the handle, it's the axe and the mace. Um, and they've also got these unique shoulder designs. So this one's got like the shooting star because the star soul mace. That one's done in silver. I'll pull forward this guy. Have a look at this guy, he's got his. They've all got the same lightning bolt motif on their uh, left arm and on the right arm you have uh, nothing at all. But it's a really good demonstration of the scheme because you can see it quite clearly. And um, as you saw in the battle report, there are liberators in the army. So if you really want to see the, how the black armor looks when it's done en masse, you'll be able to see it there uh, most of all. So that is the decimators. Um, I'm sure you'll have your thoughts on to whether I made the right call, whether I should have picked retributors or protectors. Feel free to let me know in the comments with your ideas uh, of what you think I should have done with these guys and whether you think I made the right call. And then if I do add any more paladins, what you think is worth doing, because I'm aware that the damage output of retributors will allow me to do a lot more to monsters and to heavy infantry and to heroes. And I'm also aware about the shooting protection that comes from protectors that make them pretty damn impossible to shoot to death, and thus actually able to cross the board to do the damage that they're supposed to do. Not that I do that anyway, Signs of the Storm is just too powerful. Um, so feel free to let me know. 
um, in the comments about these guys. But of course, we have a hero to show off. Um, and this guy is my MVP from the Battle Report. I'm sure you're aware of this if you watched it. If you haven't, by the way, uh, I'm pretty sure I said it in the intro, but there'll be a link in the description. You can have a look at the Battle Report um, and see where we are at. So, um, oh, crumbs, his, his um, power pack is broken. I just noticed that. That's not supposed to look like that's supposed to be much more symmetric. Whoops. Okay, never mind. Can't help it. Broken transit. So, um, that's the decimators. Now, I'm just going to go and quickly grab my hero, and we shall discuss him. And behold, all hail the might of the Night Heraldor. I bought this guy on a whim, and oh my god, I did not regret it in the slight. I'm just going to get that. Move. There we go. So, the Knight Heraldor, 100? Is he 100 or is he 80? I always forget. He is... 120? Okay, sorry, I told a lie. 120 points of nonsense. Amazing nonsense. That's what this guy is. Um, he is genuinely amazing. I'm just going to get the camera a little bit closer. Yeah, that works. There we go. So this guy is armed with a Sigmarite broadsword and a battle horn, and the battle horn is 90% of the reason you want this guy to be used. He's the same speed as most Stormcats in movement 5, he's got a 4 up save, 5 wounds, so he's pretty tough. Bravery 8 doesn't really matter all that much, but it is a thing. One thing I forgot to mention with the Decimators, actually, um, I realised this while I was recording the French one, um, they have a minus 2 bravery modifier if they kill anything. So if they... Um, no, not if they kill anything. If, if you're within six inches of decimators, you are basically plus two to your battle shot test, which is equivalent to minus two bravery. Jeez Louise, that is so powerful. I just, I just needed to point that out. Right, moving on. So this guy has two abilities. Uh, one of them is effectively a free charge. So you pick a unit within 10 inches that can then charge whether it falls back or runs. So you can easily redeploy a unit to make a long bomb charge that it probably has no right to make. Which is really nice um, for paladins, because it means you can actually run them forward and keep up with the rest of the army and still launch a charge. It means that if you need to get a unit out of combat and into another combat, let's say a hero is um, maybe stuck fighting a hero that they really don't want to fight, you can just say, right, get out of that combat, fall back a bit, and then go and charge a guy over there and pick him off. It's really, really useful like that, so that's a really nice ability, but the main one that I was using him for in the game was the Thunder Blast. In your shooting phase, pick a building or a terrain feature within 15 inches and roll a dice. Each unit within that many inches of the terrain feature takes D3 mortal wounds. This is so powerful, but it's so low-key powerful. Seriously, 15 inch range is quite long for a shooting attack. Like, you look at most shooting attacks, Let's have a look at some average shooting attacks. It's longer range than Adjudicator's Crossbow. It's only slightly. It's got more range than... It's not nearly as much range as a Prosecutor. Um, more range than Tempesters. Um, what else? More range than Lord Aquilor. More range than Concussors. More range than Vanguard Hunters. Nearly as much range as some Vanguard Raptors. That's a long way in Age of Sigmar, 15 inches. And on terrain-dense boards, there is almost nowhere that a unit will not be within D6 inches of a terrain feature. So if you can aim it carefully, you can do massive damage with this. This is really useful for, as I used it in the battle report, sniping. You can just use this to plink off wounds from hero units, from small elite units that you are having trouble to engage or just chipping away at infantry, particularly ones that are about to get charged, is just a couple of extra bits of Battleshock bravery modifiers, which is all well and lovely. It's nothing special, and it can hit friendly, so be careful with it, but it is still a very powerful ability that must be commended. If he does get in a fight, he's not terrible. He's got four attacks, hitting on threes, wounding on fours, one rend, one damage. Yeah. For a hero, it's pretty meh. Uh, you compare him to pretty much everybody, he's very meh. He's very slightly better than the Knight Vexilor. He is worse than the Knight Questor. Um, he is worse than the Knight Azeros. He is technically, he is better than the Knight Venator, but the Knight Venator is a shooting hero, so you sort of let it slide. 
Uh, and it's not really fair to compare to the Lords. Um, he's got... Uh, he's slightly worse than a Lord Relictor, I suppose. Yeah, he's, he's all right in melee, but he's nothing special. The main thing you want to use him for is as a mini buff and as a damage dealer in the shooting phase. He's a really nice combination, and I really underestimated how awesome he is. Um, so, as concerns painting, uh, nothing too much to write home about here, um, other than he's wearing... I'm not going to call it a skirt, because it's not. Um, he's wearing plate armour around his waist, which is something you don't see a lot of actual full plate armour. Or, yeah, it's not male. It's not plate either. I suppose, is it plate armour? It's like overlapping plate armour, it's certainly not male armour. Um, someone who's more of an expert on armour, describe what that is to me in the comments, I'd appreciate it. Um, he looks quite similar to the regular things, he doesn't stand out quite as much as he might do other than, like, the massive horn. Um, the knee pad is actually probably less intricate than the Paladins, uh, but the main thing he's got going on top is he's got this... I hesitate to call this thing a cloak. I really do hesitate to call that thing a cloak. But he's got a bunch of ribbons on his back, I suppose, um, which I painted in the typical red. Um, it's not quite dark on the camera, actually. And you see it in the light, It's uh, as I'm looking at it, it's a lot brighter. Uh, than you're seeing. So it's a little bit brighter than you're seeing on the camera here, but it's okay. It's fine. Uh, the sword is nothing special. It's just silver, wash, brighter silver highlight. Uh, the gold is done in the usual manner uh, with auric armor. I decided to do uh, silver down the bell of the horn. I probably should have done gold now that I think about it, but uh, it's fine. And you see again the red on the handle of the sword. Um, yeah, it's called a handle, is it? Yeah, the pommel's on the end, the hilt is this thing here. Sorry, I'm not a, I'm not a weapons and armour expert. I think I've made that painfully obvious by now. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, you've got uh, the grey cloth underneath, as usual. Uh, very dark grey rock. And I am now thinking about basing. Um, this is something that I do need to get some advice on, because I, I want to get this army based. There is a gaming night at Games Workshop in a few weeks, um, I think it's in like mid to late November, there's a, a, a big Age of Sigmar gaming night. Um, it's only 1k points, but they want your armies to be painted and based. And my army will be painted, but I want it to be based as well. So I need a basing scheme for this army. Now, stipulation, we're not doing white. My Tau army is on white bases for 40k. We're not doing that. Second point, I can't do ludicrously difficult, like, super intricate lava schemes. I've only got so many paints here with me in France. I don't want to do anything crazy. I'm quite happy to settle for a neutral brown for the base, but at the same time, that's kind of dull. So I want to get your thoughts. Um, something that will not detract from the black, but that is actually not black, because I think someone actually pointed out in the comments, uh, or is either somebody told me in the comments, or someone actually just told me in a random conversation, I think it might have been Kieran, uh, it was either Kieran or one of you guys, said that they need basing um, in the comments or whatever. And black on black, it, it does actually, I notice it now, really doesn't help the details show up on the model. So I need a basing scheme. Let me know in the comments. I want your suggestions on a basing scheme for this army. That is what I want from you today. Even if I get no else out of you, yeah, I'm going to talk Yorkshire for a second. If I get nothing else out of you, I want some basing suggestions, if you please. Please don't do anything ludicrous, because you know I'm not that good. But just something that I can do that will make the army stand out a little more and still be a unifying thing. Hopefully without tying it too much into one of the realms. But then again, thematically these guys are fighting in the realm of life and came from the realm of fire. So whatever. I'll leave it up to you in the comments. Hit me with your ideas. I think that's actually everything we need to discuss today because I've discussed the uses of the Herald on the battlefield. Um, and going forward, uh, well, you know I've got Liberators. Uh, they were in the battle report last week, so you can look forward to some Liberators next time. Um, and then I need to consider where I'm going from there. So I've already bought the unit after the Liberators and I'm currently working on them. I'm hopefully going to have them done soon enough because it's now at the time of recording and time of watching, actually, it is half term. Uh, it's the Toussaint, as the French call it. So um, we're on a break right now. So hopefully I'm going to get some time to get some hobbying done. I'm hopefully going to get this unit as done as possible. Then I either need to look into chunky heavy cavalry, or I want to get another hero. 
Now, I know I should be buying a Nightburn 8 tool soon enough, but I don't want to do that yet. We're not buying the Blight Wall stuff, discussed that already at length. So we've got a few things to consider with that. So again, expansion suggestions after we get the cavalry or before we get the cavalry, do let me know. I'm always open to suggestions. For now, though, that is the end of episode three of A Town Called Malice, my Age of Sigma Stormcast Eternal's hobby project. That is a goddamn mouthful. Anyway, thank you all for watching. Let me know what you think in the comments below. My name is Michael for Tatsuke Imperials, and I will see you all next time. Thank you very much, and goodbye.